first procedure we're going to talk about today is the bougie crike. It's given its name because we're going to be using uh, the typical bougie, which most of you are going to be familiar with, which is normally utilized uh, as part of the difficult airway logarithm. But this device has become, over the years since its inception, a great device uh, to utilize for the cricothyroidotomy. There are many different ways of performing a crike. You're more than welcome to study those other ways. But throughout the years, um, as the evolution of the procedure has come along, the bougie crike has been determined to be one of the easiest and cleanest uh, and quickest ways. Therefore, it's perfectly adaptable to the MICU and flight environment. Um, as with every procedure, you have to know your indications. So why would we perform a cricothyroidotomy? The main reason is if you've lost the ability to ventilate and oxygenate your patient. So you're not going to perform a cricothyroidotomy on a patient that has an adequate airway. So that, those things would include if a patient is able to ventilate themselves or if you're able to uh, bag valve the, the patient, that's an airway. So you're not going to perform a cricothyroidotomy on that patient. The other indications are going to be you've got somebody that you just cannot get intubated and they're progressing rapidly to the point where you're not going to be able to ventilate that patient. And that's the real trick to this procedure is not performing it too late and not performing it too early. And that's where skill and uh, uh, having confidence in what you're doing and having um, experience in the field really comes into play. So I recommend that you utilize all your team members uh, when you're deciding whether or not uh, you're going to be performing a cricothyroidotomy. Also make sure that you are thinking about this procedure long before you need it. So if you've got a difficult airway um, or you're predicting there's going to be a difficult airway, be prepared for this. Get everything out, uh, make sure you know where your landmarks are, mark the landmarks, and kind of have everything ready so that if, if it comes to that point, you're not hustling at the last minute to get the equipment that you need to perform the cricothyroidotomy. These are always going to be stressful situations. They're always going to be in a critical patient that has very unstable vital signs. And those few extra seconds can mean the difference between life and death and how easily this procedure is to perform. Now remember, this is the end point of just about every difficult airway algorithm. But just remember there's multiple steps before that and make sure you've gone in a step-by-step -step process before you get to this. So you, you're almost never going to walk into the scene and say, oh, we're going to immediately crike this patient. If you're doing that, you really need to ask, did you prepare properly mentally before you walked in here? So it's always in the logarithm, but remember there's always other things you can try. Those other things would be an oral tracheal innovation. They would be a non-visualized airway, such as a King uh, airway or a combi tube. So those are all things that you can try before you get to that point. In my experience where I've utilized this are patients that have suffered severe burns that have altered the airway, patients that have suffered severe facial trauma to the point where you can't get into an oral airway and the structures have now been altered to such an extent that you can't ventilate the patient uh, from above. Um, patients that have uh, angioedema are an excellent case where things are going to progress very rapidly. You may initially see the person when they've got a very swollen airway, they're still breathing on their own, but you can see they're progressing rapidly as you decide that you're going to intubate the patient. Then all of a sudden now you're, you're getting to the point where you can't uh, ventilate the patient, you now you can't oxygenate the patient, you can't get them intubated orally, you can't use an adjunct because their, their airway structures are so swollen that you can't get anything else in. That's the kind of case where you're going to be moving towards a cricothyroidotomy and hopefully you've prepared for that, you've planned for it, and you can transition from your oral attempts and your non-visualized attempts to a surgical uh, airway quite easily and, and, and not in a hurried and stressful manner. So again, it's called the Bougie Crike, so your, 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 your primary equipment's gonna include the Bougie. I recommend that you get, every, get that Bougie out, um, get it preloaded onto your endotracheal tube. So you're gonna load it down the endotracheal tube to start. Sometimes a little saline or a little lube can help this process. You don't want to do too much because you don't want all that occluding the tube, but um, it, sometimes a little extra lubric lubrication when you're preparing this is important. Just like you would with an oral tracheal intubation, you're going to want to have tested your, your balloon because the balloon still has to be inflated, and if it's, if it's a damaged balloon, you don't want to have to re repeat this procedure. So we're going to instill about seven cc's of air. We see the balloon comes up. We see that there's no leak in the balloon. We can then pull that air all the way back out. Again, a little saline or a little, just a little bit of lubrication can help um, in the, in the pre preparation here. Make sure you know where your 10cc syringe is. You're gonna need to have a scalpel. 
and you're going to want to have some type of securing device. Now we have commercially available securing devices. You can also use a trach tie um, in, a, in a pinch. You can use tape. And I almost always recommend that when, once you perform this procedure, you're going to want to make sure there's always a hand on this procedure. So whoever is ventilating the patient basically needs to have a hand on this because you do not want to lose this airway. When you're preparing for this, you're going to want to identify the landmarks. And when do you want to identify the landmarks? You want to identify the landmarks at any point when you think that you may be proceeding to a cricothyroidotomy, not when you're actually needing that airway. So hopefully you've already identified these landmarks in the difficult airway patient. You're going to look for the thyroid cartilage. So everyone find that on yourself at this point. It's the big Adam's apple that you can feel. And you're going to find the cricoid ring, which is below that. All right. Between that is the cricothyroid membrane. And I can very easily find the thyroid cartilage here, the cricoid ring, the divot in between is the membrane that we're going for. I would recommend uh, you know, finding this landmark not only on your own family members, find them on other patients in a non-emergent uh, condition during part of your assessment of the patient or when you have an extra second. Just getting used to finding this structure on patients will help you when you really need to find that structure. So, you know, find this structure, identify it, and then the patient has a difficult airway, mark it long before you ever have to get there. Have your equipment out, have it ready and easily accessible so if you have to move to this procedure, it's not going to be in a, uh, a hurried and rushed manner. Now why do we stay in the midline? On either side you have the thyroid gland. That gland is very vascular and the vascular supply for that gland comes up from either side. If you stay in the midline and stay away from those arteries and veins that are feeding the thyroid, you're gonna uh, have a lot less of a bloody field. Now this is almost always, despite if you stay right in the midline, it's almost always a bloody field, uh, but you can definitely stay out of having a large amount of blood if you stay mostly towards the midline. So let's do a little scenario here. I've come into a patient's room. Uh, I can see that they're having some trouble breathing. They're, in, they're, they've, they're on an ACE inhibitor and they suffer from, they're suffering from an angioedema attack. So I can see their airway is starting to swell. Now I still have time here. I'm going to be having my partner and myself starting to get very quickly ready for a, hopefully an oral tracheal intubation. But I can see from what I'm looking at during this patient, I can see how fast things are progressing that we may not be able to intubate this patient orally and I may not be able, be able to use a bag valve ventilation on this patient and or ventilate the patient at some point. So before I get to that point, I'm going to make these preparations. I'm going to find my landmarks. So I found the thyroid membrane, I found the cricothyroid membrane, and I found the cricothyroid ring. At this point, before I've even started, we're getting other things ready. I just would get out a marker. I'm going to make my, remember we're going to make a vertical incision to stay away from the vascular structure. So I make a vertical line from the, cricoid, from the thyroid cartilage over the cricoid ring, over the cricothyroid membrane. I'm going to find that membrane again. I'm going to make a horizontal mark across there. So as they always say, X marks the spot. This is where we're going to be making our incisions. Now, I can go ahead and move away from this. I've got my equipment ready. So in the, in the difficult airway algorithm, I've got everything ready. I know where I need to go. If things don't go the way that I want them to from an oral standpoint or from a non-visualized standpoint, I can now immediately move to uh, this procedure. I've already found my landmarks. I know where to expect those things and I've already got it marked. So things should proceed very rapidly thereafter. All right, so we failed from above. We're now no longer able to ventilate the patient. We can't get a non-visualized airway in. We can't use bag valve ventilation. Uh, so we're gonna move to the surgical airway. Make sure you clean the area, either using a, a commercially available chlorhexidine, betadine, alcohol swab, whatever you have immediately available. You may uh, in, inadvertently uh, lose some of your landmarks that you've drawn onto the patient at that point. So getting your finger down in there and holding that position while you're cleaning it. So cleaning everything and getting your finger there again to make sure you know where you're going is important at this point. I have already preloaded at this point my endotracheal tube over the bougie as we talked about before. I'm going to have that immediately available so my partner may be handing this to me or I'm going to have it directly available to where I can pick that up. I'm going to grab the thyroid cartilage to kind of stabilize things. I'm going to again, once, once again, confirm that my membrane is where I think it is. I'm going to start and I'm going to make an incision starting at the thyroid cartilage, coming down over the membrane and straight down over the cricoid ring. Now there's always a question of how, how, how far do you make this incision? And the, the, the correct answer is you want to make sure you get it over the entire membrane. And you also want to make it large enough that you can get your fingers and equipment down in there. You don't want to make the incision too small and then have to extend that incision. That's just going to waste more time. A little extra incision on the patient's neck when you save their life 
it's going to be a, a neg negligible co consequence there. So do not worry about you know overextending it. Now, having said that, don't make a huge long incision down throughout the entire patient's neck. But you know, a, a good landmark is start over the thyroid cartilage, extend it all the way to just over the cricoid ring. That should give you plenty of room, and that should ex completely expose the cricothyroid membrane. Once you've made that incision, you can make a blunt dissection down to the membrane. And, in this patient, they don't have a lot of adipose tissue, so we're very able, we're very easily able to make blunt dissection down, and we're able to see that what pearly white membrane. Once you've identified where that membrane is, and sometimes you can't see it, there may be blood at this point. So again, have your uh, have some gauze directly available. You may have to clear the field. Again, use that finger bluntly dissect through any adipose tissue. Use your gauze to remove any excess blood at this point. You have suction available. You may want to use suction to, if you've gotten into a bleeder, unfortunately. So have your suction available that you'd normally already have for your other airway attempts. And then find that membrane. Once you've found the membrane, you're going to make that horizontal incision through the membrane. And this is basically just a puncture and a small little incision. Once you've done that, this is where having your personal protective equipment in place already is important because if someone's trying to bag valve the patient or if the patient still has some spontaneous respirations, when you pierce that membrane, blood and uh, saliva may shoot through that or anything else that's in that patient's airway and that can directly expose you uh, and your partner and anyone else that's performing this procedure to, the, to those uh, uh, bodily fluids. This scalpel does not come out until you've got another marker inside the patient's airway. So at this point, you've already got your bougie ready. You're going to insert the bougie right adjacent to the scalpel. All right. Now I know my I know where my bougie is because I know my scalpel's in the airway. And I know my bougie is just entered right next to it. I can now very carefully place the scalpel down. I'm going to extend that bougie down as far as I can go. All right. And this bougie is typically going to go down into the right main stem of the patient. Um, as it normally follows the easy anatomy down into the patient's body. Once I've extended that down, I'm going to very quickly insert the endotracheal tube over the bougie. And what you're looking for here is you're not going to, you don't want to bury this tube because you want that balloon right about here. So right after the, you're going to watch the balloon. You're going to, so the balloon's right here. It's going to disappear through that membrane. I'm going to extend it maybe a centimeter more. That balloon is now sitting right here where my finger is in the patient's trachea. If I go any further down, I'm going to risk right main stemming that tube. And so you don't have to insert this very far. It's going to look very, very much like this, where you have a large amount of endotracheal tube extending out. So once that's in, you can immediately have your partner put approximately five to 10 cc's of air in the tube to shut off any air leak and you're going to very carefully remove the bougie. Now when you're pulling that bougie out there can be because you're using a five and a half into tracheal tube here or a 5.0 to a five and a half into tracheal tube there's going to be a little tension there so you got to be real careful you don't dislodge the tube that you just put in so make sure you've got your hand down here and you're securing that in the tracheal tube the patient's neck and then when you remove that bougie pull it out in a nice even fashion just be real careful you don't dislodge that tube. Just like you would with any other intubation, you can, you can at this point put your end tidal CO2 uh, marker over this. You apply your bag valve mask. Again, make sure you've got control of that tube. So I'd recommend that you, whoever's inserted this or your partner is always securing that tube. And a nice easy way to do that is just pinch and hold that to the patient's neck and then you can ventilate the patient. You should not hear an air leak. If you're hearing an air leak or if you're seeing blood and, and uh, uh, bodily fluids bubble up around this, that may, may mean you did not inflate your balloon or that the balloon has unfortunately suffered a failure. All right, hopefully you checked that before you applied it. And then you're gonna ventilate the patient just like you normally would. You're gonna confirm your tube placement. You're gonna look for symmetric chest rise. You're gonna feel for chest rise. You're gonna look for tube misting. You're gonna check your entitled CO2. You're gonna look at your patient. Are they, uh, is there oxygen saturation coming up? Are, is, is their um, heart rate uh, stabilizing? Is the patient in and of themselves showing, that, uh, showing stability and improvement from what you had before? Remember, if you're performing this procedure, this patient's often been ex an extremist, so you should hopefully see a rapid improvement after you've performed this procedure. And then you're going to ventilate them just like you normally would. Now the question arises whether or not you put this patient onto the vent. And there's no reason not to put them on a vent once you have this airway stabilized. Um, I'm not going to fault you if you, you know, in the, in the hectic nature of this and only having now one person, if you have to maybe extend the amount of time that you use the bag valve, but there's no reason that you can't proceed and put the patient on a ventilator once you've got everything stabilized.
So at this point, I would have someone uh, maintaining the airway, ventilating the patient. As, as that's being done, you can get one of our commercially available uh, tube securing devices, or if you have a trach tie, um, or if you have tape, either of these will work. You just have to make sure you don't uh, compress the vascular structures of the neck. So whatever device you use, um, you have to make sure that for the body habitus and size of the patient, that you're not going to be compressing the vascular structures of the patient's neck. You would then simply insert this behind the neck, securing just like you would if this was an oral tracheal intubation. You're going to come up through, making sure that you're not putting too much uh, pressure onto the vascular structures of the neck, and then secure the tube. And then whoever is staying with this patient at the head of the bed, I would still recommend kind of keeping a hand on that. Um, this will allow you to at least be a little uh, freer um, with your hands at that point because you've at least got this secured. Now there's a couple different things you can do here. Some people advocate actually cutting this into tracheal tube down, um, and we'll do that in just a second so you can see what it looks like. I used to do that um, when I was first training on this procedure, but I've decided over the years that the better option is to actually leave that tube long. It allows me to keep the bag valve resting on the patient's chest as you see here. And every, this is a much more stable, in my opinion, much more stable and easier to control airway. Now there are, there are another option. This is more labor intensive. You also risk, if you cut too low, cutting the, the pilot balloon cable, which you can see here. So this cable, if you cut below this on the tube, you're gonna deflate your, uh, you're gonna def deflate your tracheal balloon and it's, you're gonna have an airway leak. So you have to cut above this, but you can cut this down. If you do that, you have to remove the adapter piece. All right, that can sometimes be somewhat difficult to get out and then reinsert that. You have to be careful that you don't push that tube further down into the patient's airway, creating a right main stem innovation. Now, some people like this because it's less to deal with. In my opinion, it's harder to control the tube. Um, either way is correct. Um, in my opinion, uh, less is more in this instance and leaving the tube long is often the, the best option. Complications you can have from this. If you get a false passage, meaning that when you're performing the surgical procedure, you didn't properly identify the cricothyroid membrane with blunt dissection with your finger, and now that you make an incision and when you insert that bougie, the bougie does not go into the airway. The bougie can dissect through the fatty tissues of the neck, and you're actually passing the tube down through the fatty tissues of the neck into the thyroid cartilage or into the other soft tissues of the neck. That's probably the biggest and greatest complication of this procedure. Hemorrhage, remember, we're coming up on that thyroid cartilage. You've got those big thyroid veins and arteries coming over the top here. So you've gotten a little off midline maybe, or maybe the patient's anatomy has a large vessel coming across the midline, unfortunately. You can get a lot of hemorrhage here, in which case you're gonna wanna have your suction available. You're gonna wanna have gauze immediately available to kind of occlude that, okay? And if you do get into a hemorrhage after you've secured your tube, direct pressure is gonna be what you're gonna need to do to manage it. If you do have a little bit of bleeding or if you just wanna cover the site up once you've, once you've managed it, a very easy way to do that, um, use your trauma shears or another pair of scissors. Just make an incision about halfway up through a couple pieces of gauze. And you're gonna make a little Y incision, so you're gonna to cut to the left and to the right. And you can just slide this over the tube. You can do that before you put the commercially available securing device on. So let me show you what that'll look like here. So once you've, once you've inserted the tube, you've got it stabilized, you can put a piece of gauze on there. This will kind of just keep the area clean um, and help keep the, the airway stabilized. And then again, run your wire into there, secure your tube holder. Be careful when you secure the tube that you don't crank this all the way down. It's a smaller diameter tube. If you crank that too far, you can actually occlude the tube. So make sure you've just got it enough that it's holding. And again, make sure you're not putting too much uh, pressure on the patient's neck structures such as their jugular and carotid arteries because that again will decrease uh, cerebral perfusion pressure and uh, blood flow to the brain. So that is a, a surgical cricothyroidotomy using a bougie and endotracheal tube in the field.